First of all, um, good morning once again, and thank you um, to all of us for joining us here today. It's really a great privilege to, um, to have you here with us at the first ever IEA Energy Innovation Forum um, that brings together a wide range of stakeholders represented by um, all of you from around the world, uh, startups uh, as well as um, established industries, investors, academia, think tanks, and of course, governments. We are very, very proud that you all followed our uh, invitation to attend um, and participate in uh, today's Energy Innovation Forum. A very warm welcome to, to all of you. My name is Timo Gül. I'm the Chief Energy Technology Officer of the IEA, and I will be moderating this uh, first session, um, or the first half of this uh, session, before I pass on uh, later for the second half um, uh, to our uh, uh, colleague uh, Akshad Rathi. During this uh, session, we will discuss what worked and what didn't in global cooperation on technology innovation and what we need to do better um, to ensure that technology can play its critical role, not only for enhancing energy security and uh, meeting our shared uh, climate ambitions, but also for contributing to economic growth and uh, job creation. Over the past 50 years since the IA uh, was created, energy policy um, objectives have changed quite a lot. Um, uh, at the time when the technology collaboration programs, the IEA's uh, technology collaboration work uh, was put in place. This was very much about enhancing um, uh, energy and um, oil security, but um, there is a new focus um, over the last um, uh, several decades, which is about um, climate change, of course, which has given um, the whole innovation work uh, very new impetus. We have many success stories to build upon, not the microphone today, but certainly solar PV, uh, uh, wind, batteries, etc. But also we have very, very little time left for reaching net zero emissions by mid-century. Just to illustrate how past innovation cycles have uh, worked, it took um, solar PV roughly 30 years from uh, the Bell Slab in the United States to market introduction and another 30 years to achieve just 1% of uh, global uh, electricity generation. No matter how you think about innovation moving forward and uh, the future more broadly, I think it is safe to say that we don't have the luxury of being as generous again on uh, innovation cycles of the new, many new and emerging clean energy technologies that are not yet in, a, in the market. We need to significantly accelerate uh, the deployment and scale up of uh, key energy technologies. But it's also safe to say that we can do better. Uh, we have far more knowledge, uh, we are far more connected, and we can share ideas far more quickly than we could uh, in the past. And this is what today is all about. Um, the objective here is to identify the different perspectives on what's needed to support energy technologies, to move from the innovation phase to early adoption, um, to about the various um, uh, roles of different stakeholders and getting there, and importantly, how we can improve international collaboration on energy innovation and what you think the IEA can do in supporting this aim. All this with a view of being faster and being better. Uh, the role of policymakers will, of course, be critical here, um, with regards, uh, not only with regards to funding R&D and demonstration projects that can benefit society, but also in establishing policies and uh, regulations that give innovators and funders the confidence they need to take on technology risks and move quickly towards uh, the market. International coordination can be important here to accelerate deployment and create larger economies of scale, making the transition more affordable for more countries. Um, I was meant to show a slide here, I think, at this particular uh, moment, um, but um, I think it is just, I would just like to say that this, um, the difficulty um, that uh, we are currently facing in the current economic um, uh, climate, no, <laughs> see, we have, we have a technology issue today very clearly, but um, um, Anyway, this is a slide. <laughs> this is a slide. Yes, uh, it's a great slide. No, I mean it shows us. So it's all very good. <laughs> so it can't be so good. So this one, but this one is the one that I really wanted to show you. Um, the pressing concern that we are facing in the current economic climate is also about the finance flowing to clean energy entrepreneurs. It fell uh, to around 36 billion dollars in venture capital in uh, 2023, down from over 45 billion US dollars. Uh, the year um, before, which is very symptomatic of the tougher conditions that innovators are uh, facing, including higher capital costs. And in addition, we all know, of course, that the geopolitical landscape is undoubtedly uh, very complex. 
to discuss these issues. I'm now very delighted to uh, be joined by three very distinguished guests with deep experience at the highest level of government. I have a couple of questions that I will be asking um, them over what was originally thought of as roughly half an hour. Um, and I'm uh, very much looking forward to a conversation about their country priorities for clean energy innovation and their views on how we can accelerate um, progress. Alongside me today are Her Excellency Kadri Simpson, European uh, Union Commissioner for Energy, the Honorable uh, Jonathan Wilkinson, Minister of Energy and Natural Resources of Canada, and His Excellency uh, Davis Churchill, Minister of Energy and Petroleum in um, Kenya. Well, see, this is uh, really... Anyway, um, I would like to start with a question to you, Commissioner Simpson, if I may, um, given that the European Union has been a leader in international cooperation on energy R&D over, over 40 years of its research framework uh, programs. What can you tell us about the European uh, Commission's main priorities in relation to technologies that are not yet widely demonstrated, and how do you think the IEA can help realizing the EU priorities? Good morning, and uh, this is very true that European Commission has provided steer and financing <clears throat> for European research already for decades, and as early as um, already in the 90s, um, we started to um, support breakthroughs in renewable energy. And uh, as we all have seen, uh, it, this resulted to the emergence of uh, major new industrial sectors, both in Europe but also globally. And currently, Europe has two main funding instruments uh, to support research and innovation. These are Horizon Europe and Innovation Fund. Um, Horizon Europe uh, supports um, the development of the next generation of technologies required for deep carbonization. And um, I will mention some of the priorities under this Horizon Europe uh, uh, Fund. First, this is creed and storage innovation because of the expected increase of renewables in our electricity system will require major innovations in power transmission and distribution, but also grid management and storage. And uh, last uh, November, we adopted European Grids Action Plan, uh, and this recognized very clearly the need to innovate. Um, and let me just highlight the few key technologies we focus on. Uh, Multi-terminal high-voltage direct current systems. Re these are required uh, to transport vast amount of renewable electricity, uh, especially from uh, offshore wind farms. And then also energy sector integration solutions, which demonstrate the combination of the power, heat, gas, and industry with renewable energy production in diverse geographic and uh, climatic and econo economic conditions. We also prioritize uh, energy storage technologies, for example, high-performance thermal energy storage solutions or large-scale seasonal heat or cooling storage technologies. And uh, we continue also um, to support improvement of renewable energy technologies, so including their circularity. This is uh, important for solar PVs, uh, but we also focus on, uh, on wind and tidal and wave and hydropower. <clears throat> And the other pillar of our financing, the Innovation Fund, supports already more mature technologies, technologies at industrial scale. And our work focuses on three groups of technologies. First, solutions for decarbonizing the energy-intensive industries to support our industry, who is otherwise very hard to abate. Uh, then, renewable hydrogen. Uh, both production, but also its use in various sectors. And third important um, sector where we support uh, the developments um, is um, carbon capture use and uh, storage. And in fact, last week, uh, along with our targets for 2040 to cut our CO2 emissions by 90% in Europe, we also presented and adopted an industrial carbon management communication. And, uh, how we can cooperate on these priorities with the uh, International Energy Agency. Um, well, IEA has been our partner on many ways. Um, IEA's um, analysis of different policy and technology trends um, is actually a very important source of information for our policy making. And um, this, is, uh, this is a day-to-day uh, -day working relationship between uh, two of us. And, uh, and, um, 
IA also plays a very important role uh, uh, um, to support uh, us on our international initiatives. For example, we do have clean energy ministerial, uh, which, uh, which helps us to, um, to create a global hydrogen market and uh, hydrogen initiative in this regard is a very promising uh, uh, avenue uh, to help to decarbonize hard to abate sectors. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Simpson. Um, Minister Wilkinson, um, you have a lot of hands-on experience uh, before your time in government uh, in this space. So how have your views evolved in relation to uh, how best to share the risks and rewards inherent to in energy innovation, which are Canada's um, domestic um, priorities in relation to energy, RD&D and innovation? And considering the challenges ahead of us, what policies and programs are you spearheading to put um, Canadian clean energy technology at the forefront? Thank you. That's a very, very broad question to try to answer in a couple of minutes. Um, I guess what I would say is I, I spent almost 20 years in, in the clean tech space um, before making the crazy decision to enter politics. Um, but uh, I think first and foremost, there's a lot of folks around the table here who were involved in some of the earlier stages of, of technology development. And then there are others who are more on the technology deployment um, side of things. We all kind of think about things within our own prism, but I think one of the things that a policymaker needs to do is to be able to step back and, and understand that technology is fundamentally based on ideas, um, but ideas on their own are far from sufficient um, in order to actually affect change. One needs to think about um, a policy framework that actually is thoughtful around fundamental research, uh, around early stage research and development, around uh, the development process itself, and then how you actually demonstrate technologies, which is far from simple, especially with industrial technology. And, and finally, how you actually um, begin the commercial deployment phase and, and move to a point where it actually accelerates on its own. Um, there's obviously role for, for the private sector in that context, but there's a role for, for government in both setting a policy framework, but also in the context of thinking about the instruments that are required to enable companies to successfully move through that chain including assistance with things like early stage research and development, including instruments um, where the, the market is not um, capable of providing all of the, the capital that's required, particularly for long cycle technologies, that the government has a role to play in stepping in. I would say the Government of Canada is interested in a lot of technology. We're certainly interested in the deployment of technologies that we have not um, have not developed ourselves. So wind and solar is a good example of that. That Canada is not a, a leader in the development of uh, primarily wind and solar, although clearly we have interests in things like storage. Um, we are interested in lots of process technology that applies specifically to different sectors. I see ArcelorMittal here. We're certainly interested in electric arc furnaces, and I see the H2 uh, green steel folks. We're certainly interested in what Sweden is doing on hydrogen for steel. But I would say for Canada, probably some of the areas that we are particularly focused on would be carbon capture and storage um, for the purpose of mitigating carbon emissions from a range of different industrial processes, not simply the oil and gas space. And that is an area we spend a lot of time in terms of both technology development and technology deployment. Nuclear. Um, so. Uh, thinking about new uh, designs for large-scale nuclear, but obviously a lot of work going on on small modular reactors in Canada and in many countries around the world. Hydrogen um, for a whole range of different reasons, including um, looking to supply some of the needs of our friends in Europe, but that is um, reforming processes, uh, uh, that is pyrolysis uh, technologies, that is optimization of electrolysis. And, and then I would say critical minerals, which are fundamental to prosecuting the energy transition. Um, and there it's not uh, really about how do you get critical minerals out of the ground, it's about how do you process them, where the concentration of processing technology right now resides in, in certain jurisdictions, and I think there is a desire to actually have different ways of, of addressing those issues. So we have focused a lot of the tools on those areas, um, not, not exclusively, but certainly on those areas, and, uh, and certainly we look forward to and we look to other countries around the world as to how we can actually learn from each other to do better. Thank you very much, Minister Wilkinson. Now, Minister Cheche, it's really wonderful to um, have you here and to, uh, to get the perspective from Kenya here. Uh, can you explain us how your national priorities for technology innovation are similar or different to those of the European <coughs> Union and Canada, and what are the areas of technology development or adaptation that will be most important for your countries moving forward? 
Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Timura. Nice to be here to gather uh, this distinguished gathering of I uh, at 50 to reflect, like you said, on what we need to do together to basically uh, be where we ought to be with the challenge of climate change today. Um, Kenya technological innovation uh, may be different from uh, Europe. Uh, European Union and Canada as both countries are endowed differently and the energy needs are, are different. Uh, to start with, Kenya electricity access is currently at 75 percent and uh, the remaining 25 percent is the most difficult and will need technological innovation. Uh, this will be in renewable energy, mini grids, uh, to access those difficult areas that uh, today uh, are not yet accessed. Uh, solar home system with innovative pay-as-you-go business models, working, for example, with one of the leading cellular uh, mobile providers, like you did say in your opening remarks, what is needed to support technologies today is collaboration with industry. Uh, we have some solution by one of the leading solution providers called Safaricom, uh, the mo one of the leading mobile uh, companies in Kenya called MCOPA. MCOPA is a solution that seeks to uh, provide services uh, through collaborative uh, provisioning of uh, credit to access solar PV for homes uh, through a pay-as-you-go uh, solution called M-PESA. Uh, extension of the grid by use of single wire return which will allow reach to as many people as possible. And increase renewable energy in the national grid. Integration of renewable energy technologies will also come to play. Uh, this include and not limited to battery energy systems with innovation uh, business models that private sector, uh, need private sector to play more role in provision of energy services. In the clean cooking sector, majority of Kenyan populations, about 70% today, uh, as it is in most of the sub-Saharan African countries, still depend on biomass or unsustainable fuels for cooking, uh, presenting challenges of upper respiratory diseases in the way we live, uh, cooking in not very well-ventilated homes. Uh, our priority towards the year 2030, as we bridge the gap towards 100% renewable energy, will be to improve on current electricity access uh, from 75% to 90%, access to clean, modern cooking for all. We are thus quickly encouraging the participation of the private sector and non-state actors uh, to realize innova innovations in technology and deliver models that will contribute to the goal of ensuring accelerated access to electricity and clean, modern cooking by the year 2030. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. And um, in the interest of time, maybe I just ask one follow-up question to Minister Wilkinson, if I may, given that Canada is currently chairing the IA's uh, um, Committee on uh, Energy Research and Technology. Um, how do you see international collaboration uh, moving forward? Um, and uh, what do you think the IA can do to, uh, to help advance Canada's and other countries' uh, priorities in that space? Well, I think the IEA already does a lot. Um, I think there's a list of, what is it, 500 technologies that you folks actually cover. Um, and, and I think, you know, there are probably a number of different things from an international collaboration perspective. But first and foremost, it's actually about visibility on uh, what is happening out there with respect to technology development in areas of, of interest to particular um, countries. Um, we, we, we certainly um, should not be endeavoring to reinvent the wheel in every country. Uh, we should be looking at best demonstrated practices to try to actually understand how we can do things from a policy perspective, but also from a technology perspective that allows us to simply go faster. Um, Timur talked about the fact that we actually do need to go much faster than what we saw in terms of the deployment of technology um, with respect to solar and wind. Um, there are enormous opportunities, and I think actually a lot of the technology that we need to see implemented around the world actually are essentially upgrades and modifications of existing technology, so I think there is reason to be optimistic in terms of the, uh, the, the pace. But we can all go faster if we actually use international forums to learn. 
And that is certainly the IEA has been a leader in that, but so have things like the Clean Energy Ministerial, Mission Innovation, the Net Zero Producers Forum, um, a range of things that actually bring like-minded countries together to actually be able to take advantage of the learnings that we, um, that we collectively uh, can bring to bear. So I think that is probably fundamentally the most important thing. There are obviously other forums where there's active investment and research that goes on on a collaborative basis. So ITER well, with respect to nuclear fusion is a good example of that. Those are harder because of course you end up in, in challenges often around intellectual property and, and those kinds of things. But certainly models where you can actually do some of this joint work, certainly Canada and the United States talk a lot about how we can actually do some of these things together. Um, and, uh, and avoid some of the challenges around intellectual property. Um, but at the end of the day, we do not have the luxury of time to do everything ourselves. We have to be able to leverage the work that we are all doing. Thank you.